Okay, our first and opening speaker of this wonderful workshop is Andrew White. All right, uh, uh, let me start by just saying um, thank you to the, uh, the chairs and the organizers for the, chance to, for the chance to be here. Let's see, does that kill it? Yeah. Um, it's always a great pleasure to be back in China. Um, my talk today is on photonic quantum simulation and emulation, and for some reason now everything has gone blue. There we go. There we go. Um, this is work done at the uh, University of Queensland, and it's funded by the Australian government through its Centres of Excellence scheme. Okay, um, our lab, for those of you who, who don't know our lab, it has uh, roughly four areas of interest. Uh, the first one is on quantum simulation and emulation, and I'll be talking about that quite a bit today. Um, the second one is on quantum foundations. Uh, so this is you know, uh, basic questions about quantum mechanics. The third area is a long-standing interest in quantum computation, and, and in particular photonic quantum computation. And then the fourth area is quantum photonics. That's building the tools so that we can make progress in the other three areas. Um, today, really, I'm just going to focus on, on two papers. Uh, one is a, a science paper from 2013 on boson sampling. Um, one is on quantum dots, uh, that's a PRL, and of course some new stuff as well that we haven't published yet. All right. Um, you're getting to look at me, but of course uh, I work with a really good team of people. Here are the PhD students, uh, Christina, Jeff, Juan, Alexandrina, Marcus, Martin, and, and Aswa. And postdocs, uh, Marcelo, Devon, Alessandro, who's here, uh, Ivan, Michael Gunnar, and, and Till. Uh, they come from all over the world, and it's a fairly happy lab, except for around World Cup time. Um, the German and Brazilian share an office, so last year was quite fun. Um, uh, the work on boson sampling was a collaboration with Tim Ralph uh, and Saleh Rahimi Kashiri at um, UQ, and Scott Aronson and Justin Dub at MIT, and Matthew Broom, who's now at the University of New South Wales, who's also here. And the Quantum Dot is a collaboration uh, with Pascal Sella and her former student, Olivia Gazzano, in France. And the work there has been done by Juan Laredo, as well as Zakaria, and Marcelo Almeida. All right, so if we're talking about simulating quantum systems, of course, it all goes back to Feynman in this paper from 1982. And he said, we know perfectly well how to simulate any quantum system. You just have to solve Schrodinger's equation, shown up in the top right. But the problem, and it's a wave equation, you know how to solve wave equations. But the problem in quantum mechanics is the number of simultaneous equations that you need to solve grows exponentially with the number of particles in the problem. And Feynman said, this is strange if you think about it, because nature herself does this very efficiently all the time. So what's going on? Why is nature able to do this and we're not? And maybe the problem is not that nature is hard, maybe it's that we're using the wrong kind of computers. So he suggested using quantum systems as computational building blocks. And if you haven't read the paper, it's freely available online as a PDF. Go download it, it's worth reading. Uh, it's also very nice for a photonics audience because it is full of sketches of single photons going through pieces of calcite splitting into polarizations, which is what many of us do in our labs. When you read the paper, it's not clear whether Feynman was talking about emulators or simulators. And what do I mean by that? Um, say you wanted to build something that was difficult to build, like a scramjet engine that would fly you from Australia to China in two hours or three hours, as opposed to 14 hours. Um, how do you go about doing that? Well, one way is you can build an emulator, a small system where you can test models of your engine. So this is a, a shock tunnel at the University of Queensland. Um, it produces flows of 10 kilometers a second at thousands of degrees. Um, you know, you need engineers to work on it. And then you put models inside the tunnel. The shock goes past and you take a photo, or in fact, an interferometric hologram. And that photo is a physical measurement that gives you a physical quantity. In this case, on the left, it's the density of the flow, on the right, it's the electrical <coughs> concentration. But if you see something unexpected, say this flow here is coming off at an angle steeper than you expected, is that a real effect, or is that due to the emulator? Is it some artifact of the way you're doing things? So the way in classical engineering and technology that you check these things is you also build a simulator. This is from NASA. It's a series of computers they used, this was the model, and it's a digital model that gives you the physical quantity, and then if those two things agree with each other, you have confidence that you understand the situation. Um, with emulation, there's no digital error correction, so there's a verification issue, errors can propagate unbounded. Um, there is error correction in, uh, with digital models, but there's still a verification issue in that you don't know if you've picked the right Hamiltonian to describe the problem. 
And so you need a feedback loop between those two things. <coughs> in the quantum case, there's a scalability advantage that is known, and this is quantum computing. For the emulation case, it's less well understood as to whether there is a scalability advantage or not. So let's move on to what do we mean by quantum. And a nice example of that from the recent literature is Zitterbewegung. This is this trembling motion of a, an electron at relativistic speed. Schrodinger predicted after reading Dirac's paper in 1930. Um, this is a nice animation of it. So as the electron's moving from the center across the screen, you can see it's kind of smearing out. It's never been measured because in reality, the frequency is 10 to the 21 hertz, the amplitude is 10 to the minus 12 meters, so it's too fast, too small to measure. But uh, it was realized a few years back that the non-relativistic Schrodinger equation can have the same form as a Dirac equation. They're very similar wave equations. And so um, run a Blatz group in Innsbruck in 2010, published a paper where they took an iron trap, there are some ions in the middle, uh, they looked at a single iron and they were able to see this kind of trembling motion, this is this oscillation here, and they said we have done a simulation of zeta pervagum. At the same time, there was a photonic simulation done by Alex Zamart's group, where they took a, an array, <laughs> I'm ahead of myself, they took an array of waveguides and what they saw, again, you can see this motion, but they did it with classical light, so they called it a classical simulation. If they'd replaced the, they were using a laser and square law detectors. If they replaced the square law detectors with photon counters, then it would have been a quantum simulation. And then finally, the year after that, or two years after that, there was a simulation of this phenomena again with neutral atoms. <coughs> it's a single quanta effect, and that means it can be efficiently described by a classical systems. It's more surprising, I think, single quantum effects in systems with no classical counterpart. If you have optical interference, we're well used to that in the classical world, and so if you say I used optical interference to model something that's a single quantum, it's less surprising than if you used a single ion or some atoms. In either case, the modeled physics is the same. So the question when you're thinking about simulation is what is of interest? Is it the physics of the phenomena, the physics of the simulator, or is it both? And it may be both. All right, um, just to move along with quantum walks, uh, this is one way that people do single particle emulation. Uh, it's the quantum analog of random walks, and many people in the audience know this, of course. Um, the older ones will know that these were originally known as quantum random walks, and there's, in fact, a paper by that name uh, by Julia Kemper, 2003. Um, but Peter Knight famously went around saying quantum random walks are neither quantum nor random, so that kind of killed off the name. Um, they're now known as quantum walks, there's a lovely paper from Jeremy O'Brien's group in Alberta, the first authors here as well, uh, in 2010, where they sent photons into, there's a waveguide interaction region here, and then fanned them out. Classically, you would expect, well, actually, this is, you can see the beating here, here and the fan out, and they showed that when the two photons arrived at different times, they saw one kind of uh, correlation, and when they arrived at the same time, they saw a different correlation, and it was a clear signature of quantum behavior. So that's a multi-photon quantum interference. Um, we also did an experiment shortly afterwards where we looked at a, a smaller thing. This was a um, collaboration uh, with Mike Steele and colleagues at Macquarie University. Um, we had a, a circular waveguide. Uh, this gave us access to all the inputs and outputs. It let us play with periodic boundary conditions. And uh, we were free to vary the couplings. You can see there that it's elliptical as opposed to circular, so you can vary the interspace couplings. Mike's smiling because that was a complete accident. Um, smiling, I'm not oh, you're not an author. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, that's why it was a complete accident. If you'd been there, we would have it. Um, and similarly, we saw uh, classical and quantum signatures on that. Okay, why would you want to do this? Are there any interesting problems you could do with single particle phenomena? And the answer is yes. Um, there have been people thinking about quantum biology. And if you went to most people in quantum 10 years ago and, you know, asked about quantum biology, it wouldn't have got a good response. The oldest that I'm aware of thoughtful essay on this is by Schrodinger. He gave some lectures in 1943 <coughs> called What is Life? And they were published as a small book, and it's available online. And in that book, he said, look, there's definitely a quantum aspect, and it's the fact that chemistry are quantum bonds. Um, but he said both tunneling and quantum coherence don't play any role in cells and biology, except possibly in terms of 
mutation rates. So because of that, I think, if you go on to most quantum physicists 10 years ago and you said, what do you think of, of quantum biology, you probably would have got this answer, that they didn't think very much of it. Um, what if you went to biologists and you said, what about quantum mechanics? Do you think it's necessary? And I did that, and you would probably get the answer, maths is hard. Uh, and if you think I'm making fun of biologists, I've got a study to back this up. There was a paper in PNAS in 2012 showing that in biology, for each additional equation per page in the main text of the paper, you get 28% fewer citations. So just think about that if you're a theorist in the audience. No one would ever read your work, not like now. Okay, so that was kind of the standard orthodox view of quantum biology, but it's a little bit unfair because if you look back in the literature, way back in 1963, there was a clear signal of tunneling and coherence observed in the primary step of vision. Basically, you get an excitation here, and if it happens incoherently here, the efficiency of vision would be 50%. It's measured to be nearly 100%, so we know that's a coherent process. Uh, that was published in Nature. Electron tunneling and photosynthesis was also shown to be coherent. Hydrogen tunneling and enzymes were shown to be coherent. And then, of course, famously, and still controversially, a few years ago, there was all of this work talking about energy transfer and light harvesting, and showing it was coherent. Although there's still quite an argument going on that as to whether that's an artifact of how the measurements were done. Also, from the mid-90s on, people started saying there are biological phenomena that we can only explain uh, if we assume that there's a quantum phenomena going on. The most famous work was Luca Turin's work on um, olfaction, on the sense of smell, uh, where he proposed that each of you has built into your nose. And Matthew Broom's talk tomorrow, where he's going to show one of these biologically inspired single photon emulations. Okay, so let's move on to simulations. If we go back to photonic quantum simulators, um, Feynman had said, yes, let's use computational building block. That paper came out in 1982, and for 15 years almost, basically nothing happened. People knew about it, it was discussed at conferences over drinks, but there was not really any follow-up literature. Um, until this wonderful paper by Seth Lloyd in Science in 1996, and notice what he called it, Universal Quantum Simulators. And in that paper he said, you can take, uh, for any quantum problem, the initial wave function, digitize it into some number of qubits, send it through a coherent evolution, unitary evolution, and the output will contain, to arbitrarily good approximation, the answer that you're after, and it will be efficient. It will happen in polynomial time. So this was the the, the proof that Feynman's intuition was correct. And I read that paper, it was during my PhD, and I thought, oh, this is wonderful, I wonder how we can do something with it. And that took again and nearly another 10 years until this great paper by Alanis for a good second Peter Love came out, and they showed that you can use Lloyd's insights and turn the eigenvalue problem, calculating the energy eigenvalues in chemistry, into a phase estimation problem. And quantum computers are very good at phase estimation. Um, so that's their paper in 2005. Um, they also have shown a bunch of things since then. You can officially simulate chemical reactions and a bunch of other things. So lots of groups around the world did work on that. Um, our group did the easiest possible experiment, which was two qubits. Uh, that was the experiment. And this was the data. These aren't theory curves. These are measured data points as the output of the quantum computer. Uh, they agree to a MATLAB calculation to 50-bit accuracy. This is that black line. The blue is the measured data point. This unit here is the heart tree. That's a unit of energy chemists use because they don't know what a joule is. So six micro heart trees, they agree to six parts in a million. So we're very happy with that. Um, this is the ground state energy on the That's the energy. ground and first three excited states okay. of molecular okay. hydrogen. Um, so that came out in 2010. The next year, Philip Alter's group did a really interesting paper, who's also here, on frustrated Heisenberg spin system. You can think of the molecule as these kind of four white dots, and the bonds are showing in <coughs> green. And on that paper, you'll notice there's seven data points, uh, none of which sit on the curve. Now, is it because Philip is a much worse experimentalist? No. Um, it's because this is a four-photon experiment as opposed to a two-photon experiment. And as I'll talk about much later in the talk, there are real problems scaling photonic quantum simulation as you go from two to four photons. This is a good example. Um, the reaction to this, by the way, when we first started talking about it, was a bit like this cartoon. A chemist, go back to your little beakers and tubes, sweetie. This is a physics conference. Earlier, what do you study? One atom. How about you? Two. 
Um, sometimes three. You, a biologist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, quantum chemistry, they were two important early experiments. What about scaling? We well, have to do every part of the algorithm in a scalable way. There's a recipe known how to do that. You take Seth Lloyd's technique. If you have a Hamiltonian with three components, say H13, H23, and H12, you can't just turn that into a unitary like that, because that is not the same as taking that and turning it into unitary. But you can slice and dice it into small terms. And if you do that small enough, you'll get to arbitrarily good precision. Um, our colleagues published basically a table of every interesting chemical operation that you would want to do. Uh, and lots of progress has happened on this in the last few years, including in the last 12 months, both Microsoft and now uh, Alan and Peter Love again have reduced by orders of magnitude the kind of overhead you need to do this. Um, but if you wanted to do hydrogen properly with no shortcuts, you'd need six qubits. And to get to chemical precision here, these heart trees again, energy, to get to this line, you'd need just under 600 gates. Um, can we do that with photons? No. But uh, yeah. moving along, if we look at the ions, this is a paper from ICAP last year. Uh, Cornelius Hempel from Rhino Blatt's group showed 20 entangled ions controlled, measured, although you can't do topography on 20 ions. Uh, ions can do at least 100 plus gates within the coherence time. So my guess is, is if it's of interest to people, we'll see complete quantum chemistry simulation within five years. That's ions. This is a photon workshop, so what's going on? Well, let's take a break now and look at quantum computing and computational complexity. So if you go to a classical computer scientist and you say, can you give me a, a cartoon of what it is that you do, they might draw something like this. They'll say, look, we think about problems as being two kinds. There's insoluble problems and soluble problems. And we can subdivide the soluble problems into easy and hard. Hard problems are things like the traveling salesman problem or factoring, taking a large composite number and finding its two primes. The easy problems are easy because as we increase the instance size of the problem, it doesn't blow up exponentially. And so we call that efficiently computable. Hard problems are one where that isn't true. It does blow up exponentially. So if you look very carefully, this is what a quantum computer does from the viewpoint of a classical computer scientist. What's the blue circle? Um, it makes some hard problems easy. It doesn't solve all hard problems. Uh, it certainly doesn't solve any of the insoluble problems. But the fact that that particular hard problem is solved, factoring, that's the basis of most of the internet security these days. And so there was a lot of interest from government and various people on that. That's not the thing I find most interesting about quantum computing. Well, certainly not about Shaw's algorithm, which is this algorithm that solves the factoring problem. Um, if you go and read Scott Aronson's thesis from 10 years ago, uh, it's very readable, surprisingly, for a work by a computer scientist. But in it, he introduces a trilemma, which I'm going to call Aronson's trilemma. And he points out that just because Shaw's factoring algorithm exists, not because it's been demonstrated in any significant way, just the fact that it exists means one of three things must be true. The first thing is that the extended Church-Turing thesis, which is the foundation of uh, modern computer science is wrong. Um, that doesn't bother me, uh, I'm not a computer scientist, but here's the thesis. All computational problems that are efficiently solvable by realistic physical devices are efficiently solvable by a probabilistic Turing machine. But Michael Nielsen pointed out, again about 10 years ago, that the Church-Turing thesis plays the same role in computer science that Galilei and Newton's work plays in physics. It's the thing that made it quantitative and put it onto a rigorous basis. So if you go to a computer scientist my age or older and say to them, the Church-Turing thesis is wrong, they will say, no, you're wrong. And maybe they're right. Maybe the Church-Turing thesis is, is fine. Maybe the problem is this realistic physical devices. Maybe when we start building a bigger and bigger quantum computer, we'll find it'll stop working for some fundamental reason. And Scott Aronson says, this would be much more interesting than if quantum computing was possible, since it would overturn our most basic ideas about the physical world. Um, you might think, well, no one really believes that, do they? But Paul Davies has a paper where he says, if you build a 399 qubit quantum computer, it will work. But when you build a 400 qubit quantum computer, it will not work because the amount of information that would have to contain exceeds black holes, 
information something something that I don't understand. Holographic principle. Holographic principle. But as an experimentalist, I love the idea that if I had a working 399 qubit computer and I added one more qubit and it stopped working and it's the universe's fault, that's really cool. <laughs> Normally it's my fault. So, but maybe both of those things are wrong. The third possibility is that a fast classical factoring algorithm exists. Now you might think no one really believes that because mathematicians have looked for a long time. But Peter Sarnak at Princeton, who's editor of um, Acta Mathematica, one of the most prestigious maths journals, says, I love Shaw's algorithm because it proves to me that a fast classical factoring algorithm must exist. And it's not only the mathematicians. Last week, or the week before last, in Nature Chemistry, uh, one of the leading quantum chemists came out and said, I believe there's a polynomial cost answer to the strong correlation problem. We just haven't found it yet. He's saying the same thing. Um, maybe it's true. Um, to people in these individual fields, each of those things is crazy, but at least one of them must be true. And for an experimentalist, this is win-win, because it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to badly upset somebody, either computer scientists to theorists to mathematicians and chemists, so that's nice. So how do you experimentally test this trilemma? And that's how we got into to boson sample. Um, a universal quantum computer is one that's universal for BQP problems. Uh, it's been known for a decade that you need entanglement to make that work, and that a small amount of entanglement is not enough. Giffrey Vidal showed in this paper it has to grow in a certain way with the instance of the problem. And we also know more recently that too much entanglement is a problem as well. It's a very narrow path you're trying to hit. Significantly, there are no such proofs for mixed states. This is all for pure states. And so there has arisen something that we can now think of as intermediate quantum computing. These are things that aren't universal quantum computers, but they all solve problems that we don't have any efficient classical solution for. And the granddaddy of them all is DQC1, deterministic quantum computing with one pure qubit. So you take your working quantum computer you've bought from the corner store, you throw away all the pure qubits and you send in one pure qubit and all the rest are fully mixed and you operate the computer. And when that's been shown to solve a whole host of problems efficiently, I think my favourite being the Jones polynomial and not theory, it's just so unlikely. Um, the engine for all of those is this. Here is your control qubit. You put it into a superposition of 0 and 1. You control a unitary on the mixed state. Then you throw away all the mixed state qubits and you read out the pure qubit. This looks completely useless. And when it was first introduced to me by Ray Laflam at Los Alamos in the 90s, I told him this is completely useless, and I was wrong. Um, we ended up doing an experiment where we tested it for, again, two qubits. Um, if you see fringes, the thing is working, otherwise you see a straight line. We showed that alpha here, if it was one, it would be a pure qubit control. It was close to pure, it worked. Even as we turn the uh, purity down, you could still see the fringes. And in fact, you can show that as the control qubit becomes arbitrarily close to completely mixed, but isn't quite completely mixed. This computer still works and still has an advantage, an exponential advantage, over the best known classical algorithm. And that's puzzling to people because there's no entanglement. If I have a register that's completely mixed and this one's almost but not quite mixed, there's zero entanglement. So where is the power of that coming from? That's a whole separate area. There's a lovely uh, called Discord. There's a nice article by Zia Morali in Nature in 2011 discussing that. Okay, but DQC1 is just one problem. Temporally unstructured quantum computing, uh, Mick Bremner now at UTS in Sydney, permutational quantum computing, Jordan, and boson sampling. They're all different. Some of them are in spins, some of them are in photons, but if you talk to people who sit at the interface of quantum information and complexity science, they say, we've got, a, we've got a gut instinct. We've got a deep suspicion that these are all related at some deep level. And so I thought it would be very interesting to kind of play on any one of these and see if it could tell us something about everything else. So that brings us to boson sampling. Um, we've got most of the people in the room who've done the experiments, so feel free to pull out your phones. Um, here's the idea. I have some unitary network. I'm going to send in m quanta over n modes. And I'm just going to ask, what happens? Do I get things out that look like that, or like this, or maybe bunched a little bit at the middle, or whatever? Your first instinct 
might be, well, I can model that with a quantum computer. I've got m quanta in n modes. So just say as an example, I had three quanta in six modes. Um, I can model that with some qubits, so as six qubits, three-level quantum systems. Um, I know how many qubits I need to model qubits. I go to Eichenschwang, the textbook, and I find I need that number of qubits, which in this case is 12. And then this is an unstructured unitary. I have no information about it. Uh, so I need this many gates, which for 12 qubits is a billion gates. And then if I do the same thing for, for 10 photons into 100 modes, I need 100 qubits, where that's a 10 level system, which is 400 qubits, uh, and I need 10 to the 246 gates. Um, so the take home message from this slide is photons are not qubits. And I guess the other message is, can you model it with a quantum computer? No. Quantum computers have no advantage if you don't have structure that you can exploit. And we haven't looked at any structure here to exploit, so doing the naive thing would not be helpful. Here is the structure that you should exploit. So if you look at this unitary, you can write it out as a matrix, the first thing is notice you only need to worry about the entries where I'm sending in a quanta, so the rows. Secondly, I only need to worry about the columns where I'm going to measure an output. I might say I'm only going to measure on outputs 1, 2, 3. And that gives me a submatrix, and that submatrix has all the information about the problem. Okay, um, if my quanta are fermions, I can calculate the determinant of the matrix, and that's efficient. It's in complexity class P, scales as n cubed. Um, you can do a uh, there's a lovely paper by Barbara Terhall and uh, David DiVincenzo showing you can do a, a circuit of match gates, two qubit match gates, which are like a um, entangling gate in, in parity space. Uh, we did that a few years ago with photons, um, and it's kind of only of interest really because match gates plus swap makes a universal quantum computing, but match gates on their own do not. Um, for bosons, uh, you take the same submatrix, but you calculate the permanent. And it's really only different in that all the minus signs become positive. And you might look at that naively and think that's going to be not much harder to calculate, but it turns out it scales as n factorial, or really n to the n in the large limit, and it's in a complexity class P, and it's strongly believed to be classically intractable. Um, one way to think about that is consider the traveling salesman problem, um, which says, you know, I've got a medieval city with some number of bridges, seven bridges. Is there a path where a salesman can cross each bridge only once? Are there any graphs which cost less than some resource X? Um, that's the travelling salesman problem. But you could also say, how many graphs are there that cost less than some resource X? The first one's a decision problem, it's yes, no. The second one's a counting problem. And in terms of computational complexity, you can see counting problems are much harder than decision problems. So the permanent, it turns out, is in that class. Um, could we use an optical network to solve permanence? The answer is no, because yes, the output is directly proportional to the permanent of A, that's the probability amplitude, but what you measure is the complex square of that. And you lose just enough information that you gain no computational advantage. So it's like there's some new censorship principle. So no, you can't solve MP-complete problems. Um, but uh, Aronson and Arkhipov show that um, you can, the linear optical network, I'm oh, sorry, I'm ahead of myself, the linear optical network outputs distributions that are hard to calculate in classical computers, they're even hard to take a sample from, and that's the boson sampling problem. <coughs> For a computer scientist, their main result was if a classical computer can do the same thing in polynomial time as this circuit, then the polynomial hierarchy collapses. My mental image of that is this. Um, what it really means is it would make a lot of computer scientists very unhappy. Uh, and for details, have a look at Scott's book on quantum computing since Democritus. The important thing for me is that if uh, you could build a large-scale boson sampling experiment, it would be the strongest experimental evidence that the extended church Turing thesis is incorrect. And so of that trilemma, you have kind of ruled out at least one of them as being not true, which means one of the other two must be true. Um, oh, sorry, other way around. Um, what's large scale? It's something like 20 to 30 photons into 400 to 900 modes. 
a lot of people, when you look at this, you're thinking, yeah, but you're building it. Andrew, would you say that again with the double knot? So if this is not true, so, uh, then either quantum so, mechanics is false or... The well, no, you, one of those three things must be true, and you've shown that the extended Turing, the church Turing thesis is incorrect. So right. you're not saying anything about the other two, but you're showing at least one of those three things. But does it say anything about the other two? No, it doesn't say anything about the other two. Um, when you look at this, you kind of think, but it's, it's a device, and it's kind of emulating itself, and it's a bit like... Technically true, every object is an analog computer of itself. This piece of cheese, this machine is running a perfect simulation of cheese, and it's running it faster than any supercomputer. Now I'm going to convince you that's not what's happening with the boson sampling. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to hand you a black box unitary uh, with an M boson input, say 2, 1, 0, 3 photons. And I'm going to say, how often do you see one photon each at the output? If you're a classical computer scientist, you say, no problems, I just measure the unitary, calculate the permanent like we talked about before, and that gives me the amplitude. If you're a quantum computer scientist, you just put the photons through and measure the target, and you do that enough times to build up a probability. Who's going to win? Well, according to everything I just said, it's going to be the quantum computer scientist, but in reality, we don't know the effect of loss, of detector inefficiency, or mode mismatch. And so you really want to do the experiment. Um, you can use any boson, neutral atoms, phonons and ion traps, uh, superconducting pairs of fermions. Um, photons, of course, have the best coherence of any system, so they're obvious. The classical computer scientist can measure their unitary. Matthew Broom will be talking about that tomorrow. Um, you can then use that to predict probabilities, but you don't want to do that because that gets affected by detector inefficiencies. So instead, you say, look, when the photons are arriving at uh, different times, I'm going to get one kind of visibility. When they're indistinguishable and arrive at the same time, I'm going to get a different visibility. And from that, I can calculate a non-classical interference, a Hong and Mandel visibility. And I can compare that directly to experiment. Um, lots of groups published on this a couple of years ago. Um, Ian Walmsley's group, Marco Barbieri is here. Uh, Philip Volta is here. And do we have anyone from Fabio's group? No? Okay. Um, I won't go through the details of the experiment here, um, but if you're interested, come see me afterwards. But suffice to say, we found a nice way of doing a 6x6 six six unitary. Um, <coughs> if you're going to send two photons into that, there's 15 different ways you can do that. A quantum computer scientist would measure them. A theoretical computer scientist, a classical computer scientist, would also predict them. And these blue things here are uncertainties, because remember, they've done a measurement as well. And we went through and did all possible combinations of that, finding uh, that they did kind of overlap. They're roughly the same. But uh, And then if we went to three photons, I'll skip this. Um, they don't agree anywhere near as well. And when you zoom in, you find that the quantum and classical computer scientists are not agreeing always to within error. And that's really annoying to an experimentalist, what's going on. And what's going on is down conversion is not a good photon source. The higher order terms, instead of sometimes getting one photon in each arm, I'm getting two photons or three photons, and that's enough to kill your signal. And we showed that by turning the power up, and the distance between these two things is the red curve, it got higher. The um, quantum computer scientist got closer to measuring a classical distribution. So the solution is, as always with down conversion, turn the power down, but no one wants to do that. Uh, because your count rate goes away. So this brings me to the challenges for photonic simulation uh, in the last 10 minutes. There's four things we need. We need a manifold true source of single photons. We need good detectors. We need good photonic networks that are loss and reconfigurable. Um, how are we travelling with those things? Well, with detectors, we now have detectors that are photon number resolving. Uh, this is mainly led by the work of... Um, uh, Sagu Nam at NIST, uh, that are efficient, um, they've been shown up to be nearly 100%. In a different architecture we have detectors that are fast, um, we have uh, detectors that are quiet and they're very broad band. We don't have any one detector that is all of those things, but people are throwing money and attention at it and it is improving quickly. Um, we got some of the uh, transition edge sensors detectors that are photo number solving efficient, quiet and broad band, but they're not fast, so four out of five ain't bad. Um, and we used them to do a quantum steering experiment in 2012. And in that experiment, the efficiency with, say, Wu and Thomas Gritz at NIST, 
The efficiency from source to detector was 63%, uh, which was a record at the time. In our lab, we got it up to 74%, and so we did try and close a detection loophole for bells. Um, turns out 74 plus or minus 1%, you can't do it. But uh, shortly thereafter, Anton Zeiling's group did do it with 75 and 79%, and Paul Quiet's group did it with 75 and 75 So detectors have got good quickly. So I think we can put a tick next to detectors as a kind of solved problem. Photonic networks, um, you want them to be compact. For example, for the boson sampling, if it's a large network, I don't want it taking up a whole optical table. You want it to be robust, so I don't have to actively lock it. One technique that groups all over the world have been using um, is maskless fabrication groups in Germany, Italy, and Australia. You come in with a laser, you write your circuit into uh, a block. Um, we've just recently uh, tried making an entangling gate with that, the group at Macquarie. Um, and Matthew will talk tomorrow about some work we did with um, Alex Amite's group. Um, but you also want these circuits to be reconfigurable. So to make sure your unitary is hard to sample, uh, you need to be able to tune the circuit. And there's some nice work in Nature Photonics. You want them to be low loss, so the same or better than free space. Uh, they're not that, but they are getting better quickly. So I think we can put a tick on that as well. What about photons? The current best photon source is down conversion. We know a lot about it. We know how the light comes out, what it looks like in spatial terms, temporal terms, uh, frequency, polarization. Um, the problem with it is because it's spontaneous, it has a low event probability. So you might have 10 to the minus 4% chance of seeing a pair of photons with a given pump pulse. Um, this is a bit obsolete now. I think people are getting maybe 10 events an hour for 8 volts. No? No. No, okay. So maybe it's still right. You might get 10 events a day or maybe 10 an hour. It's not very high. Um, and then the higher order terms uh, kill you. So if for a photonic quantum uh, entangling gate, we showed a few years ago that just a few percent of higher order terms give you 20% gate errors. So we need much better, much better photon sources. Um, there's been a lot of work happening around the world on this uh, in the realm of quantum dots. In uh, nanopillars, this is Akimov et al. Um, and uh, Luce et al. In micropillars, that's uh, Pascal Sennelant's group in France, and in um, quantum dots and photonic band gap cavities. And in all of those, there's kind of two things that are of interest. One is, what is your coupling of your dot to the waveguide or cavity? That's beta, you want that to be as high as possible, as close to one. And um, how efficiently can you extract it out of the cavity? And uh, up until recently, kind of the best number for that was 0.4. Um, uh, which was in this paper here by Pascal Seller. They had a double cavity making <coughs> pairs of entangled photons from a single quantum dot. They were about 40% entangled. They're in higher order spatial modes. Um, we went to Pascal and said, if we knock off a cavity, can we uh, collaborate and use one as a single photon source? Um, the efficiency of that, the eta times uh, beta, was nearly 80%, so that's quite high. Um, and we used it in a paper where we showed uh, in 2013 that we could entangle them in a linear optic gate, so it was reasonably good um, indistinguishability. But what we really want to do is make a multi-photon source. So we take our string of photons coming out here, and first we see how good is it as a single photon source. We split it onto a beam splitter, and in recent measurements in our lab, uh, this is the um, Hambry-Brown twist curve. Uh, we're getting a G2 of 0 0.0056 plus or minus 0 0.0011. If it was zero, it would be a perfect single photon source. So we're not perfect, but if you zoom in on a log scale, we're pretty close. We're getting a little signal that's almost in the noise. And we think we can improve on that a little bit more. Our goal is to take that string of photons that are in the same spatial mode at different times and turn it into a an array of photons that are at the same time in different spatial modes. Um, you need a switch to do that. We've been exploring several designs. One is with Mirko Labino's group at Griffith University. Um, there's a little piece of crystal here with waveguides. And zooming in, the light comes in and gets split into these modes here by electro-optic control. Um, using not that one, but a different switch we built in our lab. Uh, if this was the single photon source going through, when we switched to two photons and repeated the experiment, 
we saw this spike. So now instead of seeing no two photon pairs at zero, we're seeing nearly only two photon pairs at zero with a little bit of noise either side. And we're working on that still. <coughs> um, so we have a bright two photon source. This is measured in the hundreds of thousands uh, count rate, and we haven't turned the power up very high at all. Um, if you take those two photons and put them through a beam splitter uh, and you make them the same polarization, ideally if you had perfect indistinguishability that would go away. There'd be no one photon terms remaining. When they're orthogonal, you can see it comes back up. So looking at the difference between those two, we've currently got a non-classical visibility of 67%. So these photons are somewhat indistinguishable. If we compare that to the best published result, oh, and the other thing is you might ask, how does it go out as you go out to one, two, three, up to 10 photons? And we find that even when you go out to 10 photons, the indistinguishability decreases by less than a quarter. That's very recent results, and we're not even sure if that's intrinsic to the dots or whether that's due to dispersion introduced by the fiber we're using to delay the photons. So, um, what is the progress? What are the, the prospects? And it's quite good. Um, this wonderful paper by Lu and Pan and their groups here in China, they had from a, a single dot on a surface a visibility of 91 plus or minus 2%. Um, not very bright, but extremely high visibility. And then last night I got an email from Pascal Sennelard saying, you can mention this in your talk, um, with their dot in cavity system, they've just got 97 plus or minus 7%. These are the raw visibilities, I oh, know 7%. These are the raw visibilities, they're not corrected for background, that's what you measure. Um, so in our lab, of course, we're trying to go to three and four fold, and we're very hopeful that within Certainly less than a year, we'll have done that with a very high uh, indistinguishability source. Okay, um, the final part of the puzzle, if you wanted to do large scale simulations, is it would be great to have strong photon photon nonlinearities. Um, <coughs> one way people have done that is they make very narrow band photons and use, for example, rubidium to get a strong nonlinearity <coughs> at single photon level. Uh, and this has come up something like 12 orders of magnitude in two years. Um, so there was work done in gradient echo memory where they're getting a phase shift at the single photon level of about 10 to the minus 12 radians per pulse. Um, if you take a, a holy fiber with this structure inside and fill it with rubidium and put narrowband photons in, which we did in a collaboration with Andre Luton at Adelaide a few years ago, we got these red numbers here, so about 0.13 microradians per photon. Um, that worked 24 hours of the day. Alexander Gaeta's group got 0.3 milliradians by making a much smaller hole, but it would clog up after an hour. Then they'd have to pump on it for 23 hours to pump it out. And the Nano Rorschenbeutel uh, last year at Nature Photonics got that up to pi radians uh, per pulse. So that's very encouraging. The problem is, of course, these gas systems are not very robust. So one of the other things that we are now starting to do a lot of theory and other groups are doing experiment on, Peter Lodal's group in uh, Denmark, is putting quantum dots in photonic band gap cavities and seeing how strong can you get a, a mediation. We've just put a theory paper out showing that you should be able to, again, in this system, get very strong photon-photon interaction. So to summarize, on the detector front and the network front, things are looking quite good. On the photons front, progress is rapid, and that should be a tick within a year or two. There's still quite a bit of work, I think, to do on the nonlinear photonics front. <coughs> so that brings me to my conclusions. Um, I guess there's only three take-home messages. The very detailed technical one is, in terms of boson sampling, we've experimentally verified that an m photoring scattering process is interesting and is robust against losses and decoherence. Taking a step back, I hope <laughs> I've convinced you that photonic quantum simulators are capable of hard computational problems. And then taking another step back, quantum photonics is back, and it's worth it's a game worth playing. So with that, thank you for your attention, and uh, do you have any questions? Thank you. So yeah, time for questions. Back from where? I thought I never went away. It, it, well, it stopped being funded in the U.S., for example. Oh yeah, that was. Uh, you 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 wrote about it in your book. I did. Yeah. <laughs> Ensuring it'll never get funded again. Not in the U.S. Not in the U.S. In China, maybe. Yeah. Okay, do we have any more questions? Yeah. 
So I knew the llama would break things. <laughs> yeah, I will couple immediately. Yeah. Um, can you explain how do you couple the quantum dots and uh, how are you gonna like? Are you planning to integrate them? Okay, so the question is, how are we coupling the quantum dots at the moment, and what are we planning? So at the moment, they come out of the micropillar, they're sitting in a, a small fridge on the optical table, um, go straight through glass, and then they're collected by a, a microscope objective and into an optical fiber. Um, the total collection efficiency at the moment of the extraction efficiency is 80%, but at the moment our collection efficiency from there down to our detectors is only about 13%. But these are also the standard detectors, which at 930 nanometers are very bad. They're 15-20% efficiency. We think we can improve on that a lot. The long-term prospects are you would want to integrate in some kind of coupling mechanism. So just recently um, on the archive, Peter Lodal had they had made quantum dots in a photonic band gap cavity and they'd written in coupling structures at the end which coupled the light out efficiently, basically wrote a diffraction grating in into the photonic band gap material that coupled the light out efficiently. Uh, I can't remember the number, but I think it was on the order of 80-90%. So this is all 3.5? Uh, that's all 3.5 materials, yep. yep. Um, of course, the other approach is the one that uh, Bristol is taking, which is you take a large range of down converters, for example in silicon, multiplex them, and then actively switch them to give you a single photon source. And there's been a lot of theory done on that as well. Uh, Mark's doing that in Bristol, I'm glad someone is, and I'm glad it's not me. Yes? Right, thanks for Let me get you the mic. So, uh, I actually have uh, two questions. The first one relates to the nonlinearity. Yes. Is there use for that for gates? So that's a good question. Is the use for the nonlinearity for gates? That would be one thing that we'd be interested in. The other thing we wanted to do is we wanted to build a single photon source that was narrow enough to address these gradient echo memories that had been demonstrated, but only with weak coherent pulses. Mm -hmm. Their efficiency is 90% at the moment, and their recall fidelity is 90%. So we'd like to see how long we can store a single photon in rubidium. And then in the solid state version of gradient echo memories, they've recently stored an excitation, not an external pulse, but a kind of internal excitation, for nearly two hours. So the prospect of that as a storage for quantum information is quite interesting. So you want very strong uh, matter light interactions for that. Well. See that. On the first question regarding the gates, um, so Jeff had this, Jeff Shapiro had this paper 10 years ago or so, and you know. Yeah. Um, where you showed that at least based on the quantum kernel linear, you cannot realize these C naught gates, for instance, because the control format gets actually messed up. They that's right. That's right. Some... And so I wouldn't suggest that mechanism. One of the reasons we are attracted to rubidium is its two photon absorption is uh, can be ten thousand or a thousand times higher than its single photon absorption. So you can build a Francin gate, and we're looking at a similar thing for the quantum dots. And there you don't suffer from the the problems that Jeff Shapiro identified. Okay. Although I should point out there's an active literature on that as well, yeah. disagreements. Right. Uh, thank you. Thanks. I think there's time for a last question if anybody has one. Yep. Uh, but wait for the mic. What's the loss? Wait for the mic. Wait for the mic. The, the question is what's the loss? What's the loss for N21 switch? That's for quantum dot. Uh, no, that's a good question. Photon, okay, so the. Yes. When in, the, in our lab, when we mocked one up in bulk optics, the loss is quite low because we're using commercial pockel cells and they can have loss on the order of a few percent. Uh, and then just round trip losses, so perhaps the overall loss is on the order of 10%. For the switch that Marco Levine is building, the integrated <coughs> one, typically when you buy these switches, the loss is 3 dB coupling loss, uh, 1 dB if you get a good one. Uh, Merco switch, we're hoping the loss will be well under a dB, maybe half a dB. So that is, of course, the other place where you have to work. The problem with commercial photonics is they don't care about loss because they've got amplifiers. Uh, so it's really only the quantum photonics people who go to them and say, could you make a waveguide that is a circle as opposed to half a circle, please, because we don't lose all of our signal. So. Okay, let's thank Andrew for a great talk. Thank you.